Let me ask you a question. Do you ever feel guilty? And uh, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of people, and it's, it's, uh, there are different things that people feel guilty about. Uh, sometimes people feel guilty about self-care, when you need to take some time for yourself, when you need to rest. Uh, I know a lot of people that once they retire, it seems like they get busier than they were when they work. Now, sometimes that might be just because they, they don't know just how to be idle. Sometimes they may feel guilty sitting and relaxing. Amen. Uh, there's some parents who feel guilty that uh, if they somehow enjoy something for themselves that, uh, you know, they're somehow cutting their family out of the rest of it. I mean, there's a lot of people who feel guilty for a lot of things. Now, some people will hear that question and think, nope, don't feel guilty at all. And, uh, you know, that's because there are people who, who think things, say things, do things with little or no regard of how they impact other people. And they have their own challenges. But if we searched our minds, we could all probably come up with a time when we thought or did something, said something that we didn't like or, or, or didn't care to do or even things that we, uh, we struggle with, and we feel guilty. And guilt is powerful. It, 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 can, uh, it can be a negative motivator, and in a way it could be a positive motivator. But uh, anybody ever have geese? Just out of curiosity, I know this seems random, but it's all going to fit. Um, I saw a sister Tammy. When growing up, my grandmother lived right next door. She had geese. And those geese, when I was really young, weren't that bad. They just stayed to themselves, didn't really mess with you too much, uh, other than uh, occasionally stepping in things that you didn't want to step in. They, they weren't bad animals, amen. But as they got older, those geese got mean. And I'm talking about real mean. I mean, they'd stick their long necks out and try to bite you right on the backside when you were going to the bus stop. They were mean. Well, I can relate to what a preacher from the early 1900s said. He said when he was uh, 12 years old, he once killed a family goose by taking a rock and knocking it square on the head. Now, uh, having that, that experience with my grandmother's geese, I could relate of why he would want to kill that goose. But um, after he did it, he, he figured his parents wouldn't notice too much because after all, they had 24 in total. And one missing, he thought, you know what? He could get away with it. But a funny thing happened. That evening, his sister pulled him aside and said, I saw what you did. And if you don't offer to do the dishes tonight, well, I'm going to tell mom. So the kid did anything he would do, any, any rational, normal person would do. He did the dishes, okay? And he went to bed that night thinking, you know what, I'm scot-free. I'm good to go. Penance has been paid. I'm set. Well, they got up the next morning and they went and sat down and had breakfast at the table. And as the mom got up to do whatever she was doing and the dad was off to do what he was doing, the sister looks at the brother and goes, I still remember what you did. So if you don't do the dishes after breakfast, I'm going to tell mom what you did. And he just kind of didn't seem phased at all. He looked at her and he said, well, I've already told mom, and she has forgiven me. Now you do the dishes, because I'm free again. Now, I share that story because it's amazing what an honest conversation can accomplish. Honesty, what it can accomplish. By the way, uh, the same is true, and particularly true, with our Heavenly Father. Amen? An honest conversation can accomplish so much. Communication through prayer is key to living a life, the Christian life. Amen? Uh, now sometimes, uh, well, not only asking for forgiveness from God, but asking for forgiveness uh, from other people is just as important as well. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's vital actually uh, to the spiritually healthy Christian to be honest and open. And, and once again, most of the time, communication goes a long way towards healing, but more especially with God. Now, in James chapter 5, verse 16, what are we told to do? We're told, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, that's what we're told to do to each other. Imagine how much more so when we do it with our Heavenly Father. Um, this morning, we will go through our fifth portion and, and, and I think likely final portion of Romans chapter 8, Lord willing. Uh, and before we finish the chapter, 
It's important that we at least hit some of the high points that we've seen along the way. If you haven't yet, uh, join me in Romans chapter 8. And we're going to begin reading in verse 31 this morning. And as you're flipping there, let's, I, want, I want to look at some of the things that we have talked about so far in Romans chapter 8. Verse 1 told us that there was no condemnation to those who were in Christ. I don't know about you, but I get excited about that verse. There is nobody that's hanging me killing a goose over my head if I'm in Christ. Amen. All your faults, all the troubles, all the things that you've done has been wiped clean if you've placed it beneath the blood of the Lamb. Verse 5 tells us that those who are in the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are in the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Then in verse 8 we're told those who live in the flesh cannot please God. What does it mean to live in the flesh? Well, it means to live in a way that disregards everything that God uh, has declared and everything the Holy Spirit witnesseth in your heart or witness to in your heart. You ignore. But verse 9 says that if you are in the Spirit, then that means God dwells in you. Verse 14 tells us that if you're led by the Spirit, then you are the sons or children of God. Verse uh, verse 18 tells the Christian that the suffering which is occurring now will be nothing compared to the splendor and the honor that you will receive. That will come to you. In verse 25 in the King James, it tells us that the follower of Jesus must wait with patience, but, but when you look at the Greek word that, that is used for patience, it's, patience is actually more properly translated to modern day vocabulary. Um, it, it's translated to persevere. Verse 25 tells us that the Christian must wait, must persevere to see that splendor and that glory which awaits you. And then in verse 28, one of my, just one of my favorite verses altogether. It tells us that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. And in verse 29 and 30, which we spent time on those three verses last week, it says that God knew, knew since the start of time, who would live by the Spirit and who would choose that predestined path to salvation or of salvation. And the true follower of Jesus experiences justification and glorification. Now, these final nine verses that we'll go through this morning, um, these verses truly give a person hope. It gives us clarity, and it gives us promise, and I trust it'll be a blessing to you. I'll ask God one more time to, uh, to bless this time that we have together. Father God, thank you again for the honor and the privilege of standing behind this sacred desk. Father, I pray you bless this assembly that we have this morning. Father, even if these are verses that we have committed to memory, I pray that as uh, I read them, Father, as your people hear them, give give us all the the ears to hear, Father, and give us the minds to be focused uh, on you and give us the minds uh, and the hearts uh, to understand uh, based upon uh, discernment given by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray that none of us uh, take these verses lightly. And I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Here's the first concept I want to share with you this morning. Romans chapter uh, 8, verse 31. It says, "We shall. uh, what shall we say to these things? What things is it? Well, it's all those things that we've gone through. I hit the highlights just a moment ago. What is it? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? The first concept that's offered here is is that you, the Christian, the follower of Jesus, if you have surrendered your life to Christ this morning, guess what? You have been cleared because of Christ. And knowing that, knowing all these things that you have been promised, all these things that have been declared in Romans chapter 8, here's the question. What is your response to all of them? All these things we've read and we've studied and and just did that high-level synopsis of, what is your response to who can be against the child of God? If you're saved this morning, God's Word asks, who can be against you? Though it appears that the Apostle Paul was asking this question rather rhetorically, it would be easy to counter with plenty 
of things. Even people. When the Christian is asked, well, who can be against you? Well, I can think of a few. I'm sure you can too. How about society? How about lawmakers? How about school administrators? How about neighbors, former friends? There are plenty of people who at times can seem to be against the Christian. But the question is, if God is for you, how much does all that opposition really make an impact? If you have the creator of the universe behind you, who is really against you? Remember that the Apostle Paul was no stranger to opposition. He was frequently met with hostility. He was beaten, criticized, ran out of a few towns. And when you think of the modern day Christian in America and you ask them what persecution is, well, it's simply that people shot them a dirty look. People didn't say hello to me when I, did, when I came to church. People make fun of me or snicker at me when I pray over my meal in public. That's the state of persecution in modern day America right now. But see, Paul endured persecution, yet he still said these things. He still said, who can be against us? Because God is for us. He was no stranger to opposition. And understand this, despite all that he dealt with and all the persecution, all the beating, beating within inches, and some people believe all the way to his death, Despite all of that, it's amazing that God's plan was still accomplished through him. God still worked through him. And guess what? You and I this morning are reaping the benefits of Paul's testimony and his work, even right now. Today, you might have things or people working against you. But know this, if you are God's, his purpose will be accomplished through and for you. Now, you guys are just looking at me, and maybe I've talked too loud. Maybe it's just one of those days where things are, are strange. Uh, let me get down here so maybe we all can understand it. Whatever it is that's troubling you this morning, whatever it is that you're concerned about, whatever it is, whoever you dislike, whoever you're having confrontation with, no matter what struggles in your family you're having, no matter that the fact that the bank account almost says zero, understand this. God is for you if you're a follower of His. His purpose will be accomplished. We just must persevere. This is also not something that is promised in the far off future. It's not promised later on in life. But as a follower of Jesus, you and I, we should recognize that God is for you in this moment right now. He has your back more so than any human being ever could. The Christian is not called to a life of being a victim or to be uh, hiding, but instead to live victoriously. To have the mindset of the psalmist who wrote in Psalm 118 verse 6, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do unto me. When you think of your Christian life, do you have that type of empowerment? Or do you walk around still feeling defeated? Do you walk around with hurt feelings? Do you walk around with gripes and backbitings? Or do you feel empowered that God is on your side? That you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Do you feel powerful because the creator of the universe is for you? I know I do. Right now, he's in your corner. In verse 32 of Romans chapter 8, it says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us not just some things, not just a little bit of things, but give us all things? Something that I believe a lot of us take for granted is that God was and is so concerned with meeting the needs of his people, that he stopped at nothing so that you and I could be redeemed. He yearned for it so much. The creator of the universe yearned for it so much that he gave up himself. What would you sacrifice yourself for? Anything? We'd like to romanticize it in our mind and think we would sacrifice ourselves for something or... 
our family, our children, our faith. But when put in that position, would you do that? He stopped at nothing so that you and I could be redeemed. He gave His Son Jesus so that you and I could stand righteous before Him at the judgment because all of us were doomed without Christ. But it didn't just stop with the surrender and the sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary. There was more to it. So many people just say, I'm thankful for the cross. I'm thankful that Jesus died. Some people say, I'm thankful for the blood, and I'm thankful for all those things. But it did not stop at Calvary. There was more to it. God was so interested in human beings, in your reconciliation with Uh, with Him, that He poured out all of His holy and His divine wrath out on Jesus, which subsequently means that the Christian will not experience the divine fury which all of us are worthy of. Jesus assumed it all. In Romans chapter 5, verse 9, we read, much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For so many people who live today, they think that physical death is going to be the worst thing that they can ever experience. A horrific car crash. Wasting away inside of a hospital room. They think that's going to be the most traumatic experience they'll ever have. But the truth is, God's Word says different. God's Word in the book of Revelation talks about His second death. And that's what all of us should be concerned with. We cannot overlook the fact that if God was able, now get this, if God was able and willing to give so much of himself, then why wouldn't he supply for your daily needs? Think about it for a second. There are times when we feel like God is far away, we feel like we're struggling so much, and it seems like for some reason God is not helping us in that moment. And I'm guilty of it. Why, God? I don't understand why you would put me through this. But think about what God has given us. God has given us something so grand and so great. He has given us the ability to live eternal. Why would he not supply for our daily needs? In Psalm 34, verse 10, God's word says, The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Why? Because God Provided. I heard one preacher say this. He said it's like a young man wanting to get married and he buys this beautiful diamond to give his wife. But he refuses to put it in a box for her to unwrap it and open it. God already gave us the most precious thing he could and that was the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. All the things that we worry about most of the time during the day, the the sickness, the finances, the conflict, society's decay, all those things that we are confronted with, they're nothing compared to the fact that our relationship was severed with God and He provided Himself a way that we could stand righteous before Him at judgment. Verses 33 and 34 of Romans chapter 8. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. I recently met a judge who, uh, he was discussing a case that he had presided over, and he said that there was this 18-year-old who was pulled over for doing 105 miles per hour in a 65-mile-per-hour zone. Now, I'll be honest, okay? I've sped once, twice in my life this week. But I'm not the kind of guy to do 105 and 65, okay? I stop at 99. That's my, that's my limit. It's not true. 
I'll do 100 sometimes. No, uh, no, he was doing 105, 105 in a 65 mile per hour zone. And the, and the judge said normally when he gets somebody that's, that's in front of him that is doing in excess of 100 miles per hour, there's some automatic sentences that he's going to offer. First, he's going to revoke the person's driver's license for a minimum of six months. He is going to give them a $2,500 fine and they're going to have to serve 10 days in jail. That is the automatic judgment that he goes for first-time offenders who are exceeding the speed at 100 miles per hour, especially a teenager. He went on to share that this uh, young man stood before him and that the prosecution and the, uh, uh, the prosecutor and, and the officers uh, came up and spoke to him and they said, you know what, this really isn't a bad kid. They started explaining a little bit about his life. They said they, they shared that he grew up in a home that was infested with drugs. His, his mom was a drug addict. She pulled him out of school at the age of 16 and said that she was going to homeschool him. But the fact is, she just sent him to work. And he went to work at this restaurant. And over the past couple of years, he went from just having an entry-level job to he became a manager of the store. And that morning when he got pulled over, when he was doing 105 miles per hour in a 65-mile-per-hour zone, he was woken up and told that the closing shift hadn't prepared the store for the next day. So he was speeding there to make sure it was ready to be opened. The judge said that there were a lot of things that stood out to him. First, that the kid had such a rough upbringing. Secondly, how he went to work and that the employer thought enough of his character and his work ethic to make him a manager at such an early age. The fact that the prosecution and the officers we're willing to offer testimony on this kid's behalf despite the fact it was obvious he broke the law. But then most of all, the judge said he was impressed that the guy did not offer any of these explanations. The kid didn't tell him about growing up in a home filled with drugs. The kid didn't talk about being pulled out of school, not being allowed to graduate high school to go to work. The kid didn't tell him that he was just trying to get to work because his employees didn't do what they were supposed to do the night before. He didn't do any of this. He simply said, you know what, yeah, I did it. I did it. And that was it. Now, this made such an impression on that judge that he reduced his fine, allowed him to do his jail times on weekends so that it wouldn't interfere with his job, and he dropped the ticket to a lower charge. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems like that judge exercised a lot of grace. He was empathetic because he had saw all the things that this kid had to overcome. And I was pretty impressed by that. Though the charge was dropped, or well, dropped to a lower sentence, or excuse me, he got a lower sentence, but it was dropped to a lower charge. There was still a penalty that he had to pay. That 18-year-old still had to come up with money out of his pocket, time out of his calendar, and he still has a ticket on his record. He will still have a charge forever attached to him. You and I are guilty of much worse than a speeding ticket. Yet if we surrender, if you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, your record is clean. It's not a sentence reduction. It is not a charge reduction. You are wiped. The slate is completely wiped clean and you will see no punishment, not just a reduced sentence. The punishment was carried out on the cross, but it wasn't just left there because victory over it came three days later when Jesus arose. And I'm not talking about metaphysically or spiritually. I'm talking about literally, physically. Jesus rose again. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 23, verse 45, God's Word says this, And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. But before that, if you look at the Gospel of John chapter 19, verse 30, it says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, It is finished! He bowed His head and gave up the ghost. Now, there's a lot that has been said, many sermons have been preached, many commentators have, have, have wrote about those three words, It is finished. But he was not alluding to the end of his physical life, he being Jesus. He was not suggesting that this torturous ordeal that he had been through had been concluded. Though both of those things are true. It is finished meant 
that the messianic duty that had been performed, it had been completed, prophecy had been fulfilled, and humanity, you, me, everyone who has ever lived, anyone who lives now, anybody in the future, everyone that you know now has access to freedom. Now, I don't know about you, but this morning, when I hear that God provided a way for everyone to be saved, all you have to do is get over yourself and ask for it, that, that's powerful. I mean, that's the gospel. That should be something that we should want to shout from the rooftops. Jesus' death was the payment for life everlasting. His, resurre his resurrection was the receipt, which proves that there is a reason for your and my hope. The second point of the text that I have for you is that you are cared for by Jesus. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 34 real fast. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make, make uh, intercession for us. Now, I know I read that once before, but it bears repeating. Jesus did not just stop at death, nor did he stop at the resurrection. But he is now sitting at the right hand of God. Now this is a place of glory, of distinction, of honor, of supremacy, and of sovereignty. While sitting in this heavenly seat, guess what? Jesus is not just looking over creation and saying, wow, we did such a great job. Jesus isn't sitting up somehow somewhere where he could because he has power over everything just sitting back with his arms crossed. The power that he has doesn't go to his head. You know what Jesus is doing? While he's sitting at the right hand of God, Jesus still has you, the follower of Jesus Christ, the child of God on his mind, because he is interceding presently for you and for me. God's word declares it. In Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That means when the follower of Jesus stumbles, that means when you mess up, you don't have to turn around. You don't have to say, you know what, I've gone too far. I can't get back within the will of God. I have, I have abused God's grace because guess what? In that moment, Jesus Christ is interceding for you. And all that the Heavenly Father can still see is the righteousness of Jesus Christ's blood. Your sins are blotted out. Jesus didn't just stop at death nor the resurrection. He is still working on your behalf. He is still for you right now, today. Robert Piccarelli wrote this. He said, Consider then that all our antagonists have no choice of bringing us again into condemnation. You ever had somebody repeat the same thing you've done wrong over and over again? You can ask for forgiveness. You can say, you know what? I was wrong. I would have did it differently. I would have did something differently. Yet they keep repeating it and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it over and over again. When you are under the blood, you can let them talk like a song that you just get tired of hearing because the radio has played it so much. Jesus forgives sin. And once you've given it to him and surrendered it, confessed it and repented of it, guess what? There is no condemnation. That will befall you. Should Satan hurl any charge against us to God, the death, the resurrection, and intercession of Christ himself will answer for us. We don't even have to utter a word. Once it's confessed, Jesus intercedes for us. He died to bear all of our sins and pay the full penalty demanded because of our guilt. He rose to declare our justification. He represents us as our advocate at the Father's hand. You understand what an advocate means? That's not just somebody who says they, they care for you, they like you. That's not just that acquaintance that, oh yeah, they're, they're, they're a nice girl, guy, they're a nice gal. Um, no, an advocate means that they are proactively going before you and saying, no, no, this one. This one's mine. They're, they're operating on your behalf, speaking on your behalf, advocating for you. That's what Jesus is doing for the follower of Jesus right now, for, for the follower of Christ.
for the child of God. Can Satan prosecute us successfully when God's own son directs the defense? Let me tell you the quick answer. It's no. And why? Because you were cared for by Christ. Now here's the third thing I have for you here. The third subject the text gives you and me is that you and I can have confidence because of God's love. We don't need any other theological debates. We don't need any other thing, uh, any other uh, $10 word that you want to explain what's taking place in Romans chapter 8. Here's what it comes down to. You can have confidence because of God's love. We'll read 35 through 37. Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You know, one thing I like to do is... uh, I love learning new things. I love learning things. Um, even if sometimes I don't even understand them. Actually, a lot of things Joe, I don't understand, but I like hearing about them. Maybe I can catch one thing that I'll understand. I like reading and hearing new things, and it's so much more impactful when the person who's communicating information to me has personal knowledge or, or firsthand experience of what they're talking about. I don't know, there's just a certain level of credibility that person has when... They know what they're talking about. Like, for instance, Randy, you've never been a cop, right? If I went to Randy, Randy Randy might be able to tell me an idea of what he's seen through TV shows and documentaries and maybe books he's read, but he couldn't tell me day to day what it means to be a cop. I couldn't either. Other than the times they've had me on the side of the road and I've had to say why I was speeding, okay? But Brother Larry over there, he could tell me a lot about what it means to be in law enforcement. He has a certain level of credibility because he has lived it day in and day out. If you look at the list we are given in Romans chapter 8 verse 35, this is why I say those things. You'll notice something that's quite interesting. Because the Apostle Paul is not talking about something that he has no knowledge of or no experience with. Because the Apostle Paul experienced every single condition listed in verse 35. All the way down to the sword. Because you want to know how he died? The Apostle Paul met his death by being beheaded by what? A sword. Everything in that list, Paul experienced. Verse 36 speaks to the fact that there is a persistent possibility of persecution for the Christian. That means there is always the, the, the possibility that you're going to face adversity. Paul is constantly met with the prospect of denunciation, of physical abuse, of 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 even death. And just like a sheep that is on a schedule for being slaughtered, just like the inmate on death row awaiting his day of execution with no chance for clemency, the Christian is always in a place where it's possible your faith will come into question and they will lead you like sheep into the slaughter. Now we have been shielded from that in this country. Thank God. But there's places in the world right now where that's not true. You declare that Jesus Christ is your Savior, they burn your house, they take your things. They imprison you. They take your life. Paul has experienced all these things, yet he is still telling us that God is for him. And we get upset and we think that God has abandoned us when we have a bad day. When we have a flat tire. When we're having troubles at work. When we get that doctor's report we really don't like. When our families, for some reason, can't get along. But understand this. No matter what present circumstance you're in, if you are following the Lord Jesus Christ, God is for you. Regardless of this reality, the follower of Jesus, we are told, are more than conquerors. Now, 
Our English word for conqueror does not really do justice to the Greek word. It's uh, hyperanoke. Uh, and what that means is, uh, and what it's translated from, is it means that the Christian has complete triumph. That means that it is the most thoroughness of victories that you could ever have. And through what means? Through Him that loves us. You can be confident that God's love provides you with all the spiritual security you ever need. Now there's often, and we talked about this last week, there's often debates on security, especially in the spiritual sense. What does it really mean? The phrase eternal security gets thrown around so much that I think it's really lost its meaning. If you look at Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, it says, For I am persuaded. And this is talking about security. So, so Christian, this morning, if you're struggling with wanting to know, am I really saved? Is the thoughts that creep into my mind, the images that creep in my mind, the, 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 dissatisfy, uh, the, 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 the lack of satisfaction, the, the anger that I sometimes feel, does that mean that I am now not saved? Am I somehow not a follower of Jesus because I struggle with this flesh that is constantly pulling at me to do the things that I don't want to do and the things that I know that's wrong? Well, look what God's Word says in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All of those things. Don't have the power you have. Don't have the ability to be as victorious as you are. If you want to talk about eternal security, then these are the verses that are typically cited. There is victory in Jesus. Does anyone agree? There is comfort in knowing that no external force on earth, but not only on earth, in heaven can remove you from God's grace. But it would be irresponsible of me to stand here before you and just stop at that statement like so many Christians do. Because contextually speaking, we can't just pluck these verses out and say, look, nothing ever. You were never at risk of being outside the grace or the will of God. Consider Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. This is, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. That means freedom. Jesus has set you free, but, but, not, don't use that liberty for an occasion to the flesh. That means you still have the ability, even after coming to Christ, to live adversely to God. There was a guy who went to a restaurant ordered a soft drink, and as soon as the waiter placed that drink in his hand, he threw that drink in the waiter's face. The guy quickly grabs some napkins, and he's trying to help him clean up, and he says, you know, I'm so, I'm so sorry, I'm just so, I'm so sorry I did that. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, I, I don't know why I do it, I just have this urge, I can't fight it. Uh, I have this urge to do this whenever I get something to drink, and the waiter, finally able to pull himself together, says, well, uh, you had better do something about your problem because you can't do Normal people, you can't do this. He goes, I, I'm sure I will remember you so that I will never serve you again if you come into this restaurant. Makes sense. That's a logical response. It was a few months later that same man came to that same restaurant and sat at a table where that same waiter was working and guess what he did? He asked for a drink. And the waiter refused. He should have. I would have. The man explained that he had been seeing a psychiatrist and that his problem was solved and convinced it was now okay to serve him. So the waiter brought him a drink. And guess what happened? The man took the glass splashed the soda pop in the man's face one more time and the waiter with that astonished face looked at him and said, I thought you were cured. And he said, I am cured. 
I just no longer feel guilty about doing it, amen? I didn't get any napkins. I didn't say I'm sorry. I'm perfectly fine with it. That is how a lot of Christians believe they can live. And I'm sorry, that's not what the Bible communicates. That's not, you can't do it. Jesus' blood is not a get-out-of-jail-free card, okay? It's not, uh, it's not a, a, a pass, to freely and willfully and habitually sin. That is how too many people use this conclusion of Romans chapter 8, claiming that you can live any way you want without consequence, and claiming that even in your denial and rejection of God, that it's impossible to sever your relationship. Though there is clear proof in Romans chapter 8 that there is no outside interference, and these verses declare it, there is no outside interference that will cause you to become an apostate. It does say that you cannot, or rather it doesn't say, that you cannot be the cause of your own apostasy. Now I might just be, like I said last week, I might just be cherry picking verses. So let me just go to God's word and show you why I say those things. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make sure your calling and election are sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Now, let me ask you a question. God, would God really have inspired this writer to write those words if it were out of the question or illogical that you could fall after being enlightened? I don't know about you, but I don't think God was looking to get his word count up. Okay? I, I don't think there's any fluff in God's word. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 4 through 6. Honestly, for me, one of the most convincing scriptures and the reason why I stand before you here, free will Baptist. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, that means you knew God, you were in his favor, you were in his will, who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. Once again, if it were impossible, if it were impossible to reject your faith, why would words like that be included in God's word? However, it is a deliberate choice. You cannot accidentally reject the word of God. You cannot accidentally reject the fact that Jesus died on the cross for you. You can't accidentally say, you know what, Christ, I don't need you anymore. Those are deliberate choices, and that is what separates you from God. Not all those other things. All those other things can't, can't, you can't lose, <laughs> you can't lose your salvation. You reject it. You throw it away. No outside factor can cause you to be out of the grace of God. You are victorious and secure as a Christian because of Jesus. And by surrendering your life to Him, your record is cleared. Your life and your soul are cared for, and you have confidence in God's unwavering love. Whew, I hope you're a follower of Jesus this morning, and I hope you're excited to declare His truths. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. For this word, Father, I'm thankful for the, uh, for the caution and the warnings for us to be diligent, and Father, and to persevere. And Father, I'm thankful for the assurance and salvation, the assurance and security of knowing that there is nothing, not even the devil himself, that can separate us from your love. Father, I pray for the followers of Jesus in here that know these things well. I pray uh, they don't just keep it to themselves, but rather they publicly declare it, Father, that they're not ashamed or afraid of it, Father, that they're not worried about oppression or persecution, but Father, just like the Apostle Paul, they are, are, are deliberate and they go out and they share it with the people they know and the people they come into contact with. Father, I pray for the lukewarm Christian that may be here this morning or may be watching now or in the future that they just, they're in a spiritual rut. And Father, they can't get out of it no matter what they do, no matter what they say. They, they look for reasons why they may be in it. But Father, I pray that they just reach out, they cry out to you, and they, they, they look for that renewal, that, that, that joyfulness that they have 
and knowing that you love them and that you are on their side. And Father, I pray for the one in here this morning or the ones that may not know you, Father, that think that they are within your will, that think they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But Father, uh, it's just a facade. They may deceive their family. They may deceive their friends. They may deceive the people that they go to church with. They may even deceive themselves. But Father, none of us can ever deceive you. And I pray this morning that if they don't have that sense of security, if they don't have that assurance and salvation that your word here in Romans chapter 8 tells us we can have knowing that you, there's nothing that can separate us from you. I pray this is the morning that you call out to them and they respond by putting true, genuine faith in your son Jesus Christ. And it's in, in his name I pray these things. Amen.